Thank you for the opportunity to present Constructing Light, a Pedagogy in Three Environments at the AMPS Transformative Teaching Conference. My name is Yael Erel, and I'm an assistant professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute School of Architecture. Light is an ephemeral material. Working with light requires experimentation and testing. As an architect, educator, and light artist, I've been teaching a lighting seminar in three different settings. From a conventional in-person classroom with a black box component that allows for live in-person experimentation in a highly controlled and curated environment, to an abroad site-specific seminar in Rome that prioritized site specificity using light as a material to converse with architecture. During COVID, the seminar morphed to an online format with the change of setting, the classes interactions and learning potentials radically transformed. What seemed to be a compromise when changing to an online format also held hidden advantages and allowed for the possibility to investigate the idea of site, context, and social learning. The online version forced a change to the course's structure. The classroom structure was flipped, i.e. lectures were pre-recorded so that we may use more of the class time for interaction, critique, and discussion. This aspect of the online format is retained today and is allotting more time for in-class work and pre-knowledge of class material and referencing to it directly in multiple times. The online setting produced an insular student investigation that were communicated remotely in a surprising revelation. This remote format also allowed students to personalize their studies, as you will see, bringing tests into their own homes and personal environments. In this talk, I would like to address how I approach constructing with light and see what are the consequences of each environment and what important aspects I'd like to acknowledge when moving back to in-person teaching. In order to unpack the impact of different settings, I will refer to the course's structure that was investigated in depth in my paper Constructing Mystery, a Pedagogy for Projecting Light, which was published in JAE. The Projected Light Seminar is scaffolded as a series of lectures focusing on different aspects of light, from understanding light as a basic material to studying the relationship between light and projection, shadow, camera obscura, reflection, and color. The lectures are accompanied with mini labs or student run experiments that respond to spatial prompts that culminate in a final light installation. The mini labs are intended to be quick exercises that ask busy architecture students to observe specific conditions, identify them and respond to them. The setting of the seminar changed the way that we share information and explore light, space and perception. Through each lab I'm going to present here, I would like to bring up some uh, conceptual differences that emerged between the different settings, linking to the different seminar content. In the first lab, we look at light and projection. Students were exposed to projection strategies in art and architecture and were asked to contextualize their own investigations in this broader context. Light has been linked to projection and drawing since antiquity. We begin with the idea of tracing the shadow of a loved one about to depart in Pliny the Elder's narrative of the invention of drawing. Following Robin Evans' insights on Pliny, we see how light projections are directly linked to drawing projection systems such as perspectival and orthogonal projection. In this lab, students can test these ideas with their own experiment, such as this student-led class performance that activated seminar students in the act of tracing absence and movement. The lab also allowed students to test geometric questions on projection. Being in person gave students access to facilities such as 3D printers and laser cutters that they may not have access to at home, 
so the geometric testing could be more robust and precise. The remote version posed a more significant challenge. Since we couldn't test light sources together or interact in space, it demanded that each student document their experiments well, and in so doing, they began to look at the relationship between light and photography. One lab that heightened our relationship to location and context was the lab studying the camera obscura. One tiny aperture and the outside bursts into an interior, structuring the image of the outside inverted on the canvas of the interior space. This was where the setting of the seminar became highly visible. In this lab, I created two forms of tests that students could experiment with. Individual objects or devices where the camera obscura tested the construction of an, a handheld camera obscura we could all test. When we compare the experience of the box camera obscura between online and in person, the online format required that we document and communicate as best we could under the light level, the light levels that we had. Whereas in person, it became to share experience, a way to share our reality together. The second version of a camera obscura that the students could test was a full room construction where the outside world migrates in its inverted form into the interiority of the building. The location of the seminar in these constructs is highly visible as it overlays the outside onto the inside. Here we see the Troy, New York Rensselaer campus overlaid onto a faculty office. In a video documentation taken this fall in a classroom, we can see the class together watching the projected camera obscura. We can witness the awe and excitement of sharing such an experiment with a group. In an abroad setting, the piazzas and streets of Rome were projected onto the studio rooms in medieval Palazzo Taverna in the University of Arkansas Rome Center as part of Rensselaer's Travel Abroad program. Here, the students were asked to construct camera obscuras in different studio interiors, documenting the context of our abroad classrooms. Being in person, we experienced the camera obscura as multi-sensorial together, hearing the water fountain, or experiencing the shocking moment of witnessing a car go by on the ceiling. We tested a camera obscura with two different aperture orientations in the same room and experienced the city unfold onto the room, entering from two different directions. Here we see the same room with a projection from another aperture. In this image, we see an overlay from projections from both apertures, creating an urban spatial collage. Pre-pandemic, only one of my student, PhD student, Hannah van der Kolk, took on creating a full room camera obscura. In 2020, when we were forced into a remote classroom setting, I wasn't sure if students could take on a full room camera obscura individually, but I was surprised to see that many did. The camera obscura has been known for centuries. Leonardo da Vinci wrote about the process of projecting the public space of a piazza indoors. The same method used by da Vinci was now deployed in different student residences. The inside merged with outside and our interior environments became our projection screen. Similarly to how Leibniz used the camera obscura as a metaphor for knowledge, students' environments became our screen, our prior knowledge onto which external information is projected onto. And we saw a personal merging of inside and outside, allowing us a glimpse as each other's lives and settings. We got a glimpse of the range of interior and exterior spaces that the students occupied. Each student creating a seal from the outside world and an aperture to let it back in.
a student adjusted the aperture location, we could uncover more contacts as this case in China. They could construct a relationship between inside objects and the outside world and could wait for the perfect weather as opposed to a scheduled classroom. In the height of pandemic isolation, students commented on how their interior spaces became theatrical projections, providing relief. The mini lab that addresses shadow confronts a 2D projection with a 3D object. In the allegory of the cave, it represents a negation of the truth, a type of deception. We try to understand the relationship between object and its shadow, not necessarily as derivative, but as a way to construct a drawing. Similar to Pliny's myth, we look at shadow as a device for drawing. When in person, we understand the relationship between two and three dimensions viscerally, seeing them together as a shared reality. When remote, the visceral conflict between what I see and what I know is not as readily available, but can be intellectually communicated through documentation. The reflection lab and lecture reveals another type of virtual, the virtual image that resides in the mirror or reflects off a surface as light drawing. We understand reflection as something that may reveal coherence or challenge it. Students experiment with materials to see how they can unfold these questions. When remote, students have access to personal equipment and their whole house can become a lab. Some ventured to look for a way to transcribe sound waves into light, making phenomena visible. The final lab addresses color. Joseph Alvarez identifies that the clearest property of color is its relativity. He sees color as deceptive since it is continually changed based on its environment. The light reflected off of an object is a combination of the color of the light of the object and the color of the light lighting it. As seen in the works of RGB by the artist Karnowski, different lighting may expose radically different drawings. In person, we viscerally experience the change of how an object perception can change under different lighting conditions. We experience the shared reality, its relativity, and deception. In this lab, we try to understand color, gain an intuition about how color is different in light than it is in pigment. When we mix color in light, we combine wavelengths, getting some counterintuitive color combinations and colored shadows. With the change of technology, it seemed that students had available to them colored light lights for experimentation at home, as we could see here. And testing light, different light colors and shadows and unpacking them during class digitally, as we could see here in a chat, was possible. With need to communicate, there was a desire to systematize the experiments and the documentation. To conclude the seminar, we move to a final act, the installation. Students develop a thesis about projection. In person, students work in teams expanding an idea from the seminar or lab into an installation. This seminar has evolved from semester to semester, and so has our relationship to the site for the final installation. Beginning from an easily darkened review room in the School of Architecture, we transitioned to a black box immersive environment, a non-site with seamless surround screens designed as a virtual reality testing space. In person, such an installation may take form of a time-based performance, considering the viewer's expectation and subverting it. 
We have access to projection screens as well as analog in-person projections, which is powerful when they're used together and confronted. Students considered how to craft and curate a viewer's passage, spatial investigation, and interaction. In the Rensselaer Travel Abroad program in Rome, the project transformed yet again, having the unique opportunity to create the final project in the Falconieri Crypt by Francesco Borromini in the Church of San Giovanni di Fiorentini in Rome, this thesis also operated as a highly site-specific project. While maintaining the desire to explore a thesis in light, we're also constructing a conversation with an existing architecture site. As students projected their light onto the existing architecture, the project spans the liminal space between analysis and intervention. Our light projections change the way we perceive the space, creating a conversation with an existing context without altering it. Light allowed us to create a temporal intervention in the space of the crypt by Francesco Bormini. Still operating as an exploration space, students experimented and cast their thesis onto space, surprised by the results. The interaction between space and projection we find on planned surprises and new spatial readings. Lastly, when we enter the online space, students conducted isolated investigations as they could not create team projects due to their spatial social distancing. This allowed them to focus on individual projects that extended a research from one of the lab. In many cases, this led to a highly methodological approach. Testing different aspects that were researched during earlier phases and even blending multiple labs. In this case, understanding how sound may affect airflow and how color mixing could appear through controlled partial airflows. Some students went outwards into their environment. Here we see reflective cubes redefining space and landscape. Students use special equipment and locations available to them, such as a treadmill and a garage, to open a threshold to a projected lightscape. Constructing an individual installation that contains movement and space. Being in one's home allows for consistent work on an ongoing light painting. As an extension to Plato's cave, this project confronts the shadow with the object that casts it. Imagining a rich narrative constructed in color and layering material properties of objects to construct line, texture, and atmosphere. Using the student's room as a site-specific location to construct an alternate world. To conclude, studying light is experiential and experimental. Teaching the class remotely prevented us from sharing our experience viscerally as a community. It prevented us from sharing the same space in which we become collective light detectives. But the remote format also introduced the flipped classroom structure, as well as a richer personal dimension into the inquiry. It allowed students to dig deeper into research, site specificity, and their own home inventions. Now that we're back in person, I will try to retain these insights and see how we can layer the benefits of both type settings. Thank you.